much, and I'm very grateful to the organizers of the conference for this opportunity to tell you about this recent work that I have been doing with Sergei Frolov. And let me just introduce some of the words that appear here, like Ramon Ramon, the ADS3 CFT2. Don't worry if you're not familiar with them. I'll give some introduction, also some motivation. And the first motivation is that it's interesting to study string theory. It's a theory of quantum gravity, but it's also a theory of one plus one dimensional models because the string is one dimensional and expands a one plus one dimensional worship as it evolves. However, unfortunately, or not very surprisingly, the computation of observables is not very easy. The simplest observable that you can think of is perhaps the spectrum of freely propagating strings. You fix a geometry, you let the string propagate, and you want to find the energy levels of the string. And in some cases, this is actually doable. Flat space is the most famous case, but there are other geometries like near plane wave geometries, when you can do this exercise, as well as certain CFTs, and in particular, Vesuminovit and backgrounds, where you can do this calculation to the end quite in detail. However, if you want a generic background in string theory, some, some generic geometry, and in particular, the geometries that you have heard from before, like ADS5, ADS4, that were mentioned in previous talks, this is very hard. And the reason is that they have very non-trivial Ramon Ramon fluxes. So if you try to describe this worship model as a CFT, that won't be a local theory. So we have to do something else. And this is just a spectrum. If you wanted to study string interactions, like splitting and joining of strings, that would be even harder. The good news, which is not really news to some of the people in the audience, of course, is that quite often string propagation is integrable. And uh, Ricardo talked about many integrable deformation of string backgrounds that are still string backgrounds. So there are actually big families of backgrounds that have this integrability property. And this exercise of finding the free string spectrum, the simplest of observable, is mapped to studying the finite volume spectrum of an integrable quantum field theory, which as people in this audience know very well, is not an easy exercise, but is often doable. So this is an interacting theory, even if the string theory is of course free. And the energy levels will be as complicated as the energy levels of an interacting quantum field theory. So because of this, my point of view is that I want to find techniques to study observables in strict theory, starting from the spectrum for rather generic backgrounds. Now, if you don't care about string theory, you can turn the reasoning around and you say, well, maybe I can study this string inspired model to learn something about integrable models more generally. And in the past, we already discovered, already discovered some very interesting properties of integrable models. For instance, we found non relativistic and non-relativistic integral quantum field the theories. These live on the worship. We found spin chains that are related to the gauge theories that appear in this ADS-CFT correspondence that relates strings to conformal field theories like n equal force superior mills, which was mentioned before. We found new type of deformations that Ricardo has discussed and some interesting limits like the fishnet theories, which actually were discovered by Zamologico before this whole ADS-CFT story, but sort of came with a new life in the context of ADS-CFT. And then if you're very bold and very smart, you can try to look at more complicated objects like form factors that are related to string interactions, boundaries, and we have heard this. And all these actually cast new lights on what we know from the theory of integrable models. So this has already been done to some extent or is in the course of doing, my motivation here is to now look at new backgrounds that have an even richer dynamics. So what I like is to have several parameters, a bit like in the story that Ricardo was saying, but I also like the idea of having a model, which in general is a complicated string model, but when I tune some parameters, it reduces to a simple worship CFT. And this will be the case that I will discuss in this, in this uh, uh, talk. The other nice feature that I will discuss at length is that I will have an integrable dynamics, which involves a mixture of massive and massless modes that are non-relativistic, which I've never encountered in other contexts. And of course, if you have, please do tell me. And because of that, 
also the sort of duals that appear in the ADS-CFT correspondence should have some slightly different features. So they should be long range and in a sense non-compact in ways that are a little bit different from other cases. And I will come back to this at the very end of my talk. So with this motivation, here is the menu and it's not a la carte, we will go in the order. So as a starter, we have a quick review of ads 3 cft 2 And then I will tell you how you turn this story of string theory into an integrable quantum field theory on the worksheet, which should be more familiar to uh, practitioners of integrability that are not string theorists. And I will tell you how to find an integrable S matrix on the worksheet for these strings, and in particular the dressing factors, which are really the part where all the dynamics is, hide, is hiding. And then I will tell you how to compute the spectrum, first by introducing a mirror model, which is related to the original theory by a weak rotation, and then by writing a thermodynamic answers for this mirror model, which is what gives you eventually the final value spectrum of this integrable model and the spectrum of this string model. Are there any questions? So stop me at any time if there are. Let's start with this review. So I will be talking about ADS3 CFT2, and there are actually several classes of ADS3 backgrounds that preserve quite a lot of supersymmetry, 16 supercharges. That's half of the case of ADS5 process 5, which is by far the maximally supersymmetric one. <clears throat> and they're all the form ADS3 cross S3 cross something else. You could have T4, you could have K3, or you could have another sphere and the circle. It is known that they are dual to some two-dimensional conformal field theory with supersymmetry, n equal 4,4 supersymmetry, but the details of how this map works are in general quite mysterious still. And in this talk, I will talk about the planar spectrum, so the flip spectrum of this simplest case of ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. Because of the reduced supersymmetry, actually this background has a lot of parameters, 20, mo 20 moduli that I can tune. Many of them are related to the shapes of the torus. For the purpose of computing this planar spectrum, what is particularly interesting are just two parameters. One is the overall tension of the string in units of the curvature radius of ADS. And the other is the B field, how much Calbramond field you turn, on, you turn on in this background. So I'm interested to keep things simple in a two parameter model for the purpose of this talk. And it turns out that actually this two parameter string nonlinear sigma model is classically integrable. So I have good hopes that this integrability carries out at the quantum level and I can complete my procedure. So let me paint you a picture of how it goes, this physics of this model, when I start from having no B field and then I crank up the B field, okay? When I have no B field, I have a background, which is a DS3 cross S3 cross T4, supported with Ramon Ramon fluxes, which are the troublesome ones. And in this way, it's very similar to ADS5. It's not known exactly what is the description of this dual, of the conformal field theory in two dimension that is dual to this. And in this case, I have one parameter which is continuous and is the tension of the string and I call it H. And the spectrum is quite non-degenerate and is quite uh, generic. Imagine that it's similar to the spectrum of uh, uh, operators in an equal force superior mean. So typical dimensions, it will involve zetas and any multiplet will have a different dimension, dimension with respect to any other multiplet as long as H is greater than zero. And in principle, you can use this TBA to get the spectrum. On the opposite side of the story, I crank up the B field to the maximum. And now I get a vesumino witten model on the worksheet with an SL2 factor and an SU2 factor, and then supersymmetry and so on and so forth. And the advantage is now I have no Ramon Ramon fluxes. Indeed, I have a local conformal field theory on the worksheet. And it's very interesting that here, actually, very recently, some progress has been made, quite some progress, on understanding the, du the dual, at least for a special value of this parameter k. k is the tension and is quantized. On the minimal value, I would say that the dual is very well understood. For larger values, there are some proposals. Maybe there is still a bit of debate there. And I think that you should probably ask Matthias about this. He's really the, uh, one of the experts in this field. <clears throat> 
the nice thing is that the spectrum here is very simple and you can compute it quite explicitly and it's also very degenerate many energy levels that correspond to different multiples end up being the same now it's very natural to do cft but you could also do tba and that's something that we that i did with my student and Andre, uh, andrea day uh, and if you do that uh, you will reproduce the spectrum very well and there is no problem and of course in the cft language you can even do more than just the spectrum but let's stick to the spectrum and then you have in between and in between is the hardest thing now you still have ramon ramon fluxes the dual is still unknown and now you have two parameters, the H, which is continuous, and the K that is quantized. We expect that the spectrum is as non-degenerate as the case with non-B field, at probably even messier. And in this case, we don't know very much. Actually, we know an integrable S matrix, but we don't know the dressing factors of this S matrix, so we cannot go on and complete this TBA construction. So this is the general picture. In this talk, I will be talking about this case and take you all the way to the TBA and the spectrum. So how does the integrable quantum field theory look like? Let's start from the symmetries and ADS3 as an SO2,2 symmetry, the sphere as an S4, SO4 symmetry, T4 as a bunch of U1 symmetries that I don't care about for the purpose of this talk. And of course, SO4 factors into two SU2s and so does SO2,2 into SU1,1. And the nice way to fit this into a super algebra is actually into two copies of PSU 1,1 slash 2. These copies have the interpretation of left and right supersymmetries of the conformal or dual conformal field theory, the famous 4,4. And indeed, they have eight real supercharges each. Now, the worship theory of the string actually has a reparameterization invariance. And if you want to study things like the S matrix, you want to get rid of all unphysical degrees of freedom. You want to scatter all the physical stuff. So what you do is that you go and gauge fix as much as possible. And this means light con gauge, just like you do in ADS5. And by fixing light con gauge, you break this PSU1, comma one slash two to half of it. You have eight, eight supercharges now that fit into four PSU1 slash one. And then you have a bunch of U1s, central extensions. So let me just show you how they look like. So here you have from the left algebra, one copy of PSC1,1 slash two, you have two Qs and two Ss, A and B go from one to two. And they give you this combination of U1 charges, which are the Cartan of SL2 and the Cartan of SU2. This combination is actually positive semi-definite by unitarity. In the right, exactly the same thing. In fact, even if this is the interpretation of these charges coming from PSC1,1 slash two, for, the, for what follows is useful to say, I just introduce an H, which is the sum of these two guys, of these two left and right pieces of the Hamiltonian, if you want. And this H is really the worship Hamiltonian. It will be the Hamiltonian of my integrable model and it's positive semi-definite. And then the difference I call M and that will be some combination of spin and is not positive semi-definite. Now the new ingredient, which is similar to what happens in ADS5 is that with respect to the original symmetries, you get a central extension, which appears off shell. And this couples the left and the right superalgebra. And there are one for the Qs and one for the Ss. So the particles will transform in representation of whatever this algebra is. They will be labeled by the central charges of the algebra, which are eigenvalues H, M, C, and C dagger. So I just have to study the reducible representation and I will find the particle content. In fact, by studying the theory, you realize that you don't just want irreducible representation, but you want short unitary representations. Short means that you have a shortening condition between the charges, which is this quadratic constraint. And then unitarity tells you that this C and this C dagger are related in some way, and H is, semi, uh, is positive or non-negative. And another thing that you get is this M is quantized. So you want to list all the representation of this form and actually it's very easy. First of all, you find that by looking at the worksheet interpretation of these charges, this relation, this quadratic relation gives you a dispersion relation on the worksheet. So this is the energy of a single particle of momentum P 
and is square root of m square plus 4h square sine square of p over 2. And this is non-relativistic, as I promised you. It's actually sort of lattice-like, intriguingly. And then you find that the, represent the, uh, the representation will just be labeled by the momentum m and h. And they always have this form. Either there is a boson, and then you create two fermions and back to one boson, or a fermion, two bosons, and back to one fermion. And for any values of m and for any values of h and for any values of p, they all have, all have this form. So let me give you a list. For any string tension, we take p between minus pi and pi, so this, there is a periodicity here. And then we label things depending on what m is. So I will call left the particles that have m equals plus one and their bound states that have m equals plus two, plus three, plus four, and so on. These are really bound states in the sense of the Warshitas matrix. One with one will give you two and so on. I will call right minus one and the bound state, minus two, minus three, minus four. And I will call massless the ones with m equals zero because the dispersion relation no longer has a mass cap. And if, you have to, if I want to be picky, I should tell you that there are actually two such massless representations. And the dispersion relation now becomes non-analytic. And when you have this relation, it is an analytic, you should say, well, then I should distinguish between particles that move on one branch or on the other branch. And I give them name on the one branch, I call them chiral. On the other branch, I call them anti-chiral. Notice that even if there is this split, these particles don't move at the speed of light. It's not a relativistic dispersion. The velocity will depend on the momentum, but there are two branches. Okay, and now I go and construct the S matrix. And to construct this matrix, I just consider a pair of irreducible representations, say a left and the left, or a left and the right, or a left and the massless, mass uh, chiral or antichiral, and so on and so forth. And I construct this block by first of all demanding that it commutes with all the symmetries that I had in the light gauge. So these are 16 by 16 blocks. And it turns out that this commutation fixes them almost uniquely up to an overall prefactor which cannot be fixed just by taking commutators, of course, and automatically, without assuming anything else, satisfy the young baxter equation. So I only have to fix the dressing factors. Another lucky thing is that not all these dressing factors are independent, because for instance, unitarity will relate some of them, parity will relate some of them, and also symmetry between relabeling everything that I call left with everything that I call right, which is just an arbitrary label. So at the end of the day, let me just tell you, for particles of, of fundamental uh, characters, so particles that are either masses of mass equal one or minus one, what dressing factors I get? <clears throat> I get one dressing factor when the particles have either both plus one or minus one mass, or U1 charge, I should say better, and another one when they have opposite U1 charge. Then I get one for when one is massless and the other is massive, regardless of what is left and right. There is another one which is related by unitarity, but I just write it, but it's not independent. And then I have the case of two massless particles. And if I have to be careful, I should distinguish the case where they have the same chirality or opposite chirality on the worship. Everything else, like mass equal two, mass equal three, and so on, will be obtained just by fusing these particles into bound states. So I don't have to do, to do this right now. So let me now try to construct these dressing factors. And the next step to construct these dressing factors is to introduce good parameters. And the moment are not good parameters in this theory. They are awkward parameters. Better parameters are these Zukowski variables that are also used in ADS5. They are given by this complicated formula, which I have right, but you should not look at it that much. The important thing is that these x plus and x minus, they're related to e to the ip by this simple rational function. And they're also related by a rational function to the energy. And in fact, pretty much the whole S matrix, you can write in terms of rational expressions involving x plus x minus. That's why they're useful. The matrix part of this matrix. And if you look at the ugly formula, you find out that for physical values of the momenta, these axes live in the complex plane outside the unit circle. If you do the crossing transformation, which you can do also for this non-relativistic model, you go to the, from the particle to the antiparticle region, you flip the sign of the momentum, you flip the sign of the energy, 
and you go from outside the unit circle to inside the unit circle, x goes to one over x. Now this is for generic m, this picture. For m equals zero, something special happens because you see when m is equal to zero, this formula simplifies, this m here drops, the square root simplifies. And then at the end of the day, you get that x plus and x minus are related. They're just inverse to each other. So I can just have a single x without any plus or minus. And another thing that you realize is that while you, you could have complex momenta for massive particles, you cannot really make bound states of massless particles. So they just live on a line or rather they live on this green half circle if they're physical particles, or if you do the crossing transformation, x goes to one over x again, and they live on the bottom of the circle. All right. By knowing these rules, you can write crossing equations that impose essentially particle to antiparticle and analyticity symmetry on your S matrix. And they look remarkably ugly. They look like this. Here they are the one of the massive guys. You see that the massive of the same left and left and left and right, they are coupled by this equation and vice versa. The right hand side is sort of a mess, it's some explicit mess, but it's a mess nonetheless. Then you have massless with massive, massless with massless. It's also some explicit expression. It's a little bit simpler because you can write it in terms of, the, of this function f, but it's just some rational function. And again, massless with massless. And what you realize is that actually, if you stare at these equations, there is no solution of these equations that is meromorphic in the x plane. You have to put cuts somewhere. Now, this story is not very different so far from ADS5. Also in ADS5, there was a crossing equation, only one. It also requires some cuts. And the solution was the famous Beiser Tatum Staudacker phase, which can be written by decomposing in terms of several functions, this x plus and that x minus, and then introducing some integral here. And this integral is the property that is absolutely fine outside the unit circle. If you go inside the unit circle, you start having cuts. And these cuts have a precise interpretation in terms of the bound states that you can scatter in the intermediate channels. So it's very tight, the interpretation of this phase, but it's not the answer for ADS3. So how do you come to the answer for ADS3? I cut a part of my talk where I was comparing with an older proposal by myself and my collaborators, which was wrong. And I can give you only the right answer, which came out uh, a few months ago, but I can comment in the question if you're curious of, uh, why we thought something and then we had to correct it. The first observation is that this BS phase, it does play some role. It seems to play some role if you do perturbative calculation on the worksheet. It seems to know about the bounce scattering. So what we are going to do is to take all the dressing factors and remove a BS phase from them. Of course, we can do this without loss of generality, but the idea is that hopefully this simplifies our problem. One has to analytically continue the BS for the massless guys, but that's just technical and you can do it. Another thing that is convenient because these two equations for sigma and sigma tilde, they are coupled in the crossing equation. To disentangle them, you can work with the product and the ratio of sigmas. That's just a technical thing. The other interesting thing is that if you look at the massless particles now, you realize that there is a parameterization of the variable X that makes the matrix part of this matrix of different form. It's not relativistic. The dispersion is not relativistic, but it is of a different form. Then it's very natural to introduce this parameterization for the massless particles. But what we are going to do is to introduce a similar parameterization also for the massive ones in terms of these gamma pluses and gamma minuses. And the interesting thing is that this looks a little bit like relativistic rapidities, in particular crossing corresponds to a shift of either plus or minus i pi, depending on whether you're doing massive or massless. So I'm splitting the problem into two parts, one that has to do with the BS phase and one that has to do with this rapidities gamma. The BS phase is sort of inspired from the massive part. The gamma is inspired from the massless part, but I'm sort of mashing them together. And now I can rewrite the crossing equations for the simplified objects in terms of the, of the new variables. And you see that they depend only on these objects, gamma one, two, which are difference of gamma one minus gamma two 
with indices plus and plus, so gamma one plus minus gamma two plus, and so on, gamma one plus minus gamma two minus, and so on. And they are very simple functions. And similarly, gamma minus satisfy a mon monotony equation, again, very simple, and so on and so forth. Another thing which is quite interesting is that you could think that maybe you can start from the massive phases and just take the mass to zero in some way. And you have to be very careful if you want to do this, because if you take this equation, you see the crossing here is done on the first particle and the second particle is just a spectator. You can take the massless limit in the second particle and you will recover this equation where the first particle is massive, but the second is massless, but you cannot take the limit of the first particle, meaning that the crossing transformation and take the massless limit don't commute. Or if you want the type of analytic continuation that you do for massless particles is different from the one that you have to do for massive particles. So they are quite different beasts. And now let me just tell you how you solve these equations. You just need one assumption. And the assumption is that the solution is also a different form in terms of these variables, gamma. And if you assume that, this is your solution. So let me explain here. There is a part that has some poles and some zeros that you need to reproduce the bounds of the theory. Here, there is a part that does not have poles, but reproduces the crossing equation. And this phi is actually a familiar function that I'll tell you in a second. Similar thing for the psi minus in terms of these poles here, given by the cinches and another function phi hat. So these functions, I'm going to write them in a slightly implicit way. They are given by this kernel. So if you integrate them back, you get the function with this initial condition. And this is actually the sine Gordon dressing factor. And this is actually the cousin of the sine Gordon dressing factor, which appears in this problem here. They can represent it in many ways. There is an infinite product representation in terms of gamma, but they are very manageable and very nice functions. You can also write them explicitly as dialogues. And then that's all you need. You go on, you repeat the exercise for the mixed mass. You have again some poles, some zeros, and you have here your sine Gordon dressing factor. And for the massless guys, you have here the sine Gordon dressing factor. And this is exactly the sort of form uh, of the CDD factor that Chang Lim had in his talk a moment ago. This is actually needed to reproduce just a minus sign in the crossing equation that distinguishes this dressing factor from the sine Gordon. For people that are familiar with ads -CFT, I should say also that this combination of four phi's is exactly the hernandez lopez phase. It's another way of writing the hernandez lopez phase. And these are, as if you want, the massless limits of the hernandez lopez phase. Now I have my factors, my dressing factors. I can go and I can compute the spectrum of this theory by the TBA. Yes. How much factor Let's see. So how, how unique is uh, the possibilities? Like, can, can you dress it further, for example? So the so, statement is that this is the minimal choice. Is the minimal choice of singularities or something? I would say unique if you assume that it's of difference form, because basically this is the unique solution that has no poles, and then these poles are completely fixed by the bootstrap of bound states. Uh -huh. So in the physical okay, so strip, you just say, yeah, I, I cannot have anything more. If you reject this assumption of difference form, then I don't have a proof that there aren't other solutions. Uh -huh. I, I see. The assumption is phi and phi hat don't have singularities? Yes, I in the physical stream. Okay, good. Thank you. Or in the physical region. More questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. Of course. So how in ADS5, all you're using is basically symmetries plus the spectrum. In ADS5 is 5, the symmetry is pretty much irreducible. So here, it's not so clear. So it could be free parameters. And to fix them, I would guess, you will need to compare to world sheet theory, which needs to be done to be sure that yes. this. So there is a part that I, I didn't have time to discuss, which has to do with the, the comparison with perturbative calculation on the worksheet. You can do it easily a three-level calculation on the worksheet and these matches, and then you can do loop calculation on the worksheet, but they are very subtle precisely because you have these modes without a mass cap. But let me say that in a sense, this is a bootstrap principle, but some of my ingredients, some of my assumptions in particular, the crucial assumption is that I have a piece here 
where I remove the BS factor and then something which is of difference form. This is informed secretly by perturbative calculations. The fact that the BS factor should appear is something that you guess by looking at the perturbative calculations. Otherwise, you know, like this is just an assumption and we would have been really moving in the dark. More questions? Okay. So to get to the spectrum, I have to tell you something about this mirror model then. Oh, well, maybe quickly. Um, I remember, well, maybe just about the difference with the old proposal. I remember my vague memory is that the old proposal had similar structure to this. Basically, you, you were adding Hernandez Lopez pieces on this crossing. Yeah. So what is the actual it looks very similar then, or not? Uh, yes. So uh, there was a previous proposal of a few years back. It's, it's contained in the, uh, this paper of 2014 and subsequent papers. And the difference is that there, this BS factor here was not present. And this BS factor, if you go and expand and higher loops, more than one loop, it will have a dramatic effect because essentially it captures the fact that even when you scatter, massless particles, you can have intermediate massive particle and bounces thereof in the loop inside. So, so the, it's the, in the previous proposal, there was kind of the AFS factor sitting there. Yeah, there was the AFS and factor. And that's the one that has the bad analytic yes. properties. And now yeah, there was another factor, which is called the AFS factor, is, is the first order of this piece here. But by itself, that had bad analytic properties in a sense that I'm going to tell if I have the time. And the other thing is that actually it turns out that this phase was actually just completely different, the sigma minus. And in fact, we realized later it violated parity. So it was just wrong. All right. Moving on. So I want to just comment on a standard trick. I want the finite volume spectrum. That's hard. What is easier is to exchange space with time and compute the finite temperature spectrum spectrum or the finite temperature grounds the free energy and from there get the spectrum in some way that I will mention. And if you exchange time with, space with time, you exchange the Hamiltonian and the uh, momentum. So the new uh, model has a tilde, this mirror model, and the Hamiltonian is minus i pi, uh, minus i p, the momentum of the old model, and vice versa, p is minus i h, p tilde is minus, minus i h. If you do that in a relativistic theory, you go back to where you started. If you do that here, you got some theory which, with a dispersion relation that looks nothing like the one that you started. It's a new model with different symmetries and different dispersion, but the symmetries and the dispersion are related to the old model by analytic continuation. So also the matrix part of the S matrix is related to the old model by analytic continuation. And I'm going to demand that the dressing factors are also related to the old model by analytic continuation. With the old phase proposal that Ben mentioned, this fact was failing. I didn't know how to do the analytic continuation of this dressing factor to get to the mirror model. In this case, it's very easy because this is something that you can work out for the BS phase. And then the other uh, new phases have some representation as product of gamma functions and it's straightforward to continue them to wherever you want. And how do you continue? Well, you just say that before your physical region was lower half plane and you have to shift your strips just like in the relativistic theory is a bit like half crossing that you are doing for this mirror cont uh, continuation for the massless mode is even simpler they live on a line so what you have is that above you have the physical region below you have the cross and smack in the middle you have the mirror region the purple one so you just move your particles there so with all this you have a proposal for this matrix and phases it satisfies crossing and unitarity and parity in the string region, so it's nice. You can use to construct the bound state as matrix, so mass two, mass three, mass one, m minus two, m minus three, and so on. You can continuously, uh, you can analytically continue this to the mirror region in an unambiguous way. And once you do that, it's still unitary, which is absolutely non-trivial because the notion of being real has changed, and actually the reality condition will mix bits and pieces the BS part to the uh, sine Gordon part, they will mix in the mirror theory when you take the, uh, the complex conjugate. And also you can do the fusion for the bounce of the mirror theory and that also works. So all is nice and consistent. 
And now I can just do the calculation that gives you the thermodynamic beta ansatz. And there are some experts here that can do it with one hand uh, tied behind their back. But for the others, let me remind you, for this mirror theory, you write beta equation, this is the schematic form. Then you look for large volume and you look for beta streams. So the configurations that are important in the thermodynamic limit. And I'm going to tell you what they are. They're actually extremely simple. They are the fundamental particles and the bound states, which for the left, I call Q particles. For the right, I call Q bar particles. There are the massless particles, which are stable on their own right. And then there are some auxiliary roots that appear in the TBA, and there are just two of them. That's it, no comp non complicated uh, string complex uh, or root complexes and so on and so forth. This is anyway the proposal. Then you write beta equations for these strings. So we have, for instance, e to the p tilde r, this is the mirror momentum quantization. And then you have scattering a q particle with another q particle, any other q particle, scattering a q particle with any other q bar particle scattering a Q particle with any other massless particle, scattering a Q particle with any other auxiliary particle. And then the rest is the same. You can scatter a Q bar with anything. You can scatter a massless particle with anything. You can scatter an auxiliary particle with anything. Then the recipe is absolutely standard when you are in this form. You take the thermodynamic limit. You introduce densities for these roots. You set the temperature to be finite, you impose thermodynamic equilibrium, and you get a bunch of integral equation for the densities. This gives you the mirror free energy, which is the same thing as the ground state energy of the original model. Instead of using densities, it's actually convenient to introduce these y functions, which are related to the pseudo energies. And I call them yq, y bar q for the q particles and q bar particles, y0 for the massless, and y plus minus for the auxiliary particles. And then the equations are actually basically straightforward to find from the form of the beta young equations, but you can simplify them a little bit by smartly using integration kernels and get them to a more natural form, which is which goes in the direction of something called the Y system. So let me just sketch to you how this goes. First of all, this is the ground state energy, and you see that it gets contribution from this YQ, YQ bar, and from the massless guys doesn't get contribution from the auxiliary guys. And then the YQ particle for a generic large, large enough Q is related just to the Q plus one and to the Q minus one and similar for the YQ bar. So this is a very simple form of the, of the simplified equations. This star S is just some convolution with a, a standard Cauchy kernel. Now, when you get to Y equals one, to Q equals one and Q bar equals one, it gets a bit more complicated. There is a part here, which is simple, a part that involves the auxiliary functions, which is slightly more complicated. Here I put a little twist, because if I do the untwisted case, the regular case is just supersymmetric, the energy is zero. So it's just a little bit of generality that they gave myself to break supersymmetry and get a more interesting result. And then there is a complicated part that I didn't write. And now I'm going to tell for the experts, this convolution with a check just means that if you try to rewrite this as a Y system, then this part drops out of the Y system, but you only have it in the discontinuity relation. So it's not important for the Y system. Finally, the massless equation, well, this is a mess, we didn't manage to simplify it. Everything couples with everything, and it seems to be in some way different from the other type of uh, TBAs that were encountered in ADS-CFT, more work or new ideas are needed to simplify. And then there are the auxiliary functions on which I don't want to insist. So let me conclude. So what we did is that based on some minimal assumption on addressing factors and the string hypothesis, we derive the TBA equations. And this just by analytic continuation can give you the final volume spectrum for excited states. We had to correct the dressing factors, and we saw this important thing that there is some interaction already in the dressing factor between massless dynamics and massive dynamics. And then, of course, everything couples in the TBA. And of course, you could also go and truncate only to massive or massless modes. That would be a different integrable model. It would not be the whole model of the um, of ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. 
What is most interesting are the open questions. So the simplification of the TBA is not finished. It would be interesting to write a Y system, which is the first step to get this quantum spectral curve, which is in a sense equivalent to the TBA, but much more powerful computationally. And there has been already a proposal which didn't follow this derivation. It was more like an educated guess based on symmetry and experience, uh, but there are still a little bit of debate and things to understand. And I think it will be discussed next week in the program. The other thing is that we have this equation, which you study them. For instance, we can take the TBA equation and expand them as small h. As small h, it will look like this thing wants to be some sort of simple spin chain. So maybe we get some spin chain dynamics, but you also see that when you don't have m, it looks very funny. So maybe there is some sort of long range dynamics in this spin chain is something that should be understood. You can be more ambitious and look at correlation functions. We started this, but it's of course a much more difficult problem. But what we demonstrated, I think, is that it is amenable to this hexagon formalism that was used in ADS5 versus five. And that is really the interesting stuff. You can try to tackle the stuff in the middle. I told you like, so no B field and maximum B field. We, now we more or less understand in the middle, X and Leones. And you see that the dispersion relation gets changed in this very strange way where you have this periodic part, but then you have also this linear part. And this gives you very mysterious analytic properties that make it very hard for me to come up with resting factors and therefore with the TBA. But it is very interesting because then you could hope that you can describe this for any value of H and K and then you can start tuning H. For instance, you can approach slowly, slowly the special point where you only have K and you don't have H. And you have this Vesominovitten model, which in integrability is very simple. It's actually a theory where you have stress excitation that move at the speed of light. And then you have an S matrix like the one that uh, Chang Green was talking about. This is, oops, this is exactly the, uh, the dressing factor that you will have in a TT bar deformation. So it's very, very simple theory. And somehow there should be a way to start from this generic integrability story and then take the limit and map it to a very nice uh, and very much under control CFT and see what, for instance, on the hexagons or other tools that we use in integrability are mapped to when we go on the voice of the model and we express them in CFT. So that's something that should be very interesting. And I hope that there will be much progress on that. Last thing, I already spoiled it before. Uh, thank you for your time. I wanted to advertise this school where worksheet integrability will be discussed and uh, there are still a couple of weeks to apply. So if you're not interested student or postdocs, please do advertise it. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Alexandro. So let's see, uh, time for questions. Uh... Uh. I have a question about the solution of this uh, TV equations. Uh, did you try to uh, study asymptotic limit and, and uh, usually I expect the transfer matrix formula gives you a solution and which also gives you a Y system. So uh, we are not, uh, well, we, the study of the solution is still in progress, but one thing I already can tell you in ADS5, like in other theories, you can separate an asymptotic part given by the transfer matrix, essentially, the asymptotic transfer matrix, I should say. And then they have exponential corrections given by the Y functions, but here the corrections will not be exponential. So even if you do this sort of split, the, the Y functions involved in the massless particles will not be suppressed because essentially the suppression that uh, you got normally is due to this, this, this mirror, this person relation. Sorry. Well, anyway, the dispersion relation, yeah. Normally it has a mass cap, and that means that when you have virtual particles, your, uh, your transfer matrix is suppressed. And that is what gives you the suppression of Lucier corrections and the Y functions. And this is not the case when M is equal to zero. So this is gapless also in the mirror. Uh, I have another question about this checking this result. Do you think uh, some other results by pure spinners, hybrid form, is, is, is it relevant to this story? So uh, there are some, so there is a, an approach which is uh, uh, the hybrid approach, which was developed to understand exactly this sort of ADS3 background. And uh, my understanding is that it works very well in ADS3 uh, 
uh, in AD352, when you are exactly at h equals zero and maximum k, so when you are, sorry if I'm jumping around quite so much. So when you are precisely in this regime, h is precisely zero and k is especially one, it works very well, but in general it works well for any k. And then when you uh, start turning on h, you have a complicated system of ghosts that you have to introduce. And you can write the equations, but you cannot quite solve them. There is a paper by Eberhardt and Ferreira where they solve those equations in the BMN limit. Uh, but to my mind, but I might not be 100% on this, this is pretty much what is known. So there is no systematic way, for instance, to use that, that formalis to expand in powers of H for fixed K and get control there. But maybe it's just because people uh, should you know, go back to these old papers and look at them with fresh eyes and uh, th there could be something very interesting there. And indeed, you know, like there's been lots of development, so it's not excluded. At least I cannot exclude it. Thanks. Hi. Um, want to ask, is, is there any way to quantify uh, when finite size corrections set in on the field theory side? So like... Uh, yeah, so the first comment is that the field theory side is not a field theory in the, is not a, a is not given by a gauge theory. It should be some two-dimensional two conformal yeah. field theory, which already like, you know, the intuition of Feynman diagrams and so on is a bit out of the window here, unfortunately. Um, I would say this is work in progress. So the idea is really to take these TBA equations and study them order by order in H. And then what we get at H equal to zero and H, sorry, order zero in H and order one in H will be some hopefully simpler dynamics, maybe some straightforward integrable model. And that will be you know, like the indication of what uh, uh, the dynamics is. But a big problem is that unlike ADS4 and ADS5, I don't have a gauge side microscopic Hamiltonian or even Hilbert space uh, for this model. And uh, I mean, there is a proposal which I mentioned here, uh, which should be revisited, but uh, yeah, there is nothing quite as solid as uh, for ADS5 and ADS4. So it's very interesting, but very non trivial problem. But is there some intuition like in ADS? Yeah, the intuition is that uh, essentially the massless modes already in contribute at order H. So basically, the first wrapping starts at order H in terms of, I mean, it, it's like having a, a genuine, in ADS5, you have order by order wrapping as you go up in the coupling. Here you have a part of the dynamics which is immediately wrong range. It's a bit like you know the Calogero Southern La models that we that saw, where you have just some part that is immediately wrong range. In fact, it might not even be a spin chain, but maybe it's something more complicated, some some more complicated integrable model. Yeah, but on the string theory side, it's uh, massless excitations going once around the cylinder. Yeah, or yeah. There? there are massless excitations going once around the cylinder. Yeah, yeah. Um, so from uh, Sergei Frolov's talk at another conference, I re recall there is still some disagreement with well sheet computations. Yes. So could you comment on that? And may, could it be that uh, this construction is not unique and there is some feed and parameter which allows you to sort of tune it? And... So uh, the construction is not unique uh, in, in the fact that there was this assumption of splitting into a BES part and then saying that everything else must be of different form in, in these gamma variables. That's the, the assumption that if you reject it, then you have many more possibilities. Now, uh, the calculations that can be done uh, on the worksheet are, uh, let me start from uh, sort of perturbative calculation on the worksheet rather than semi-classic. So there you have a BMN calculation and your flat space calculations. And I think that our proposal matches with everything at three level, there is no problem. At one loop, we match with the near flat space calculation, but not with the near BMN calculations of Sundin and Wolf. I should say that uh, there were some mismatches already with the uh, near BMN calculations at one and especially at two loops of, uh, already with the previous proposal and even the dispersion relation does not match. And that might indicate that there is some subtlety in the regularization of the inference effects in particular I think Sergey discussed that in in Berlin is the order in which you regulate the infrared with respect to the ultraviolet that was maybe something to be revisited. The other thing is that uh, uh, each 
could be interesting to revisit also semi-classic calculations like your calculation uh, with uh, Fyodor and uh, other collaborators, because I remember that there, uh, there was a little bit of a, like the, the calculation itself, uh, I don't have a reason to believe that it had problems, but you were using a beta ansatz that was not quite correct to extract the phases. And so maybe uh, one should relook really look at it a little bit and see if, uh, if it matches or not with the new proposal. I'm not sure if you, if you had a look. Because there was something on the assumption of unitarity uh, that uh, was not quite right, but it's because we were based on some other proposal that was not quite uh, correct. So yeah, that, that might be an easy check. So you would expect the, the dual field theory to be particularly simple and effectively free when you set attention to zero. So can you try to see the spectrum and see whether it ma matches any free or almost free CFT? Uh, yeah, so I expect it to be simple, as you say. Uh, I have not, uh, uh, so we have not done that, but generally speaking in integrability and especially in the TBA where you do this contour deformation trick where you construct states, states by analytic continuation. It's sort of easy to look at a state and extract the dimension quite carefully, but to count all the states is very subtle because you might be making mistakes of essentially which kind of singularities you allow in your analytic continuation. And by the way, uh, I would be very happy to have, if experts of these analytic continuations and so on could give me some insight on this. So for counting just basically free states is a little bit tricky. So we will certainly get some results, but it's a bit subtle to see if you can get all of them. What is more promising, I think, is to look at first order deformation and look at sort of, you know, like how this thing deforms away, because there I think there would be more, more information. I mean, one naive guess you could have is that it wants to be the symmetric orbifold of the T4, but at the point where you haven't resolved it, where you... Can you see it, any signs of this? I mean, no, 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 this stage is early days, I, I, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a very, yeah, it's very interesting guess. And I think it's, yeah, it would be very interesting to look at this with that in mind, but yeah, I cannot give you insight on that, unfortunately. Thanks for the input though. Okay. So my question is, if uh, I haven't understood, if you have the Y system, because that could no. be useful. And when I mean Y system, I, since you make the reference, I mean also the discontinued equations. No, uh, we don't have it. And uh, you're very welcome to, <laughs> I, I know that you're an expert and uh, you're very welcome to uh, have a look at this and I'm really eager to discuss with you. The reason why we don't have it is that up to this point is sort of very similar to ADS5 and ADS4. Uh, these bits here are the parts that uh, uh, that appear in the discontinuity relation, just like in ADS5. Yeah. This part is the new beast, and one has to introduce how to see, one has to understand how to simplify this equation for the master's modes. You see here that the, I still have all of the Q's and all of the Q the, bars. These are the, 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 these are, I guess, because I, I couldn't follow. So, so these are the, the, somehow the physical scattering. Uh, yeah, yeah. Matrices. Yeah. So the, the physical kernels. Yeah. No, because so you know is, yeah. that. So the working out of the Y system is a good signal that you are on the right track, and you Absolutely. can do many things about excited states. In this case, plus I would say in the Y system, but also a very fundamental uh, discontinuity equation. I, I, I agree absolutely, and uh, I think it would be a different kind of Y system. So uh, it's, uh, I mean, even if you are just interested in integrability with no reference to strings, you might be very curious of what the hell we get out of this. Okay, hey, more questions? Actually, I have one comment. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of studying TVA, you can study Hagen on TVA. In that case, the solution is character solution. So probably you can find the solution. So, uh, if you study Hagen on TVA, I didn't get there, sorry. No, no, In, if you start from Hagen on TVA, then the uh, character solution is uh, usually the, the simplest solution. The mm -hmm. Y function is a constant. I see. So this would be, uh, uh, you mean Agarro TBA would just be the thermal TBA rather than mirror or something? Yeah, you switch mirror and physical. Yeah. Uh, but what would be the, I mean, if I'm interested in understanding the spectrum, 
Well, but the form of the TBA is somewhat similar in between whether you study Haggard or not. On the, uh, the I, TBA, so there so may be some... I must admit, we didn't think of this, so it's very interesting. Uh, maybe we should have a chat afterward. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, we were sort of focused on getting the spectrum. The mirror theory is the more natural thing, especially because, you know, like it gives us the possibility of looking at maybe some simple states and expand and maybe do some numerical plot, as you know very well. Uh, so, yeah, that was sort of our first uh, thought. But, yeah. Uh, Maybe you can tell me about it. I'd be very curious. Right. Um, so I it just, you mentioned something at the very end about um, truncating to the massive sector, uh, to massive, just the massive part of the model or the massless part mm -hmm. of the model. Where did that go? Um, so they give you some integral models, which I guess have nothing to do with string theory a priori. I kind of just something, is, is there some kind of, general theory about these non-relativistic integrable models, what the space of them might be, or like whether you expect many, I don't many know. or they should be? So I think that this is a bit of a special case because in ADS5, it's very simple. You put one particle, you get the whole multiplet by symmetry, and when you go to the fundamental things, you get all the bound states, and then you are done. Here is a bit funny because if you put the massive particles from the point of view of the S matrix bootstrap, you could say, I stop there. I just put massive particles. Then you would have no reason to introduce, uh, you would have the same crossing equation, but you would have no reason to solve it in this, in this sense because these gamma functions, these gamma rapidities have more to do with massless. And similarly, if I only start for the massless particles, I have no reason to put the BS phase. I could just, I have something that is of difference form. Why on hell, why on earth I should start putting a BS phase that knows about bound states of some other particles that are not even there. So it's just that, you know, like you could cook up a different model. The TBA would, would look at the, the very different. What it represents, uh, I do not know. And I mean, th these models were studied. Uh, I think in that case, indeed, the Agadon TBA of this massless theory was studied by Stefanski and collaborators. But the, the, the relation, I mean, it's an interesting model, but the relation to this one, even to a sector of this one, is absolutely not obvious. And I should say that maybe it seems the latest news from the quantum spectral curve approach is that you just do this quantum spectral curve bootstrap just by symmetry and so on, and you do get, uh, so that's, that was not initially clear, but now this, it seems to be the claim, you get these phases that have this mixture of massive and massless dynamics from the quantum spectral curve, possibly model some assumptions, but uh, this is the paper by Gromov and collaborators. So it seems that maybe, you know, like the quantum spectral curve really knows about, or the putative quantum spectral curve really knows about everything. And if you want to do only massive or only massless, you have to sort of put it by hand in some way. I think that the Y system that uh, Davide was asking about will clarify a little bit what is going on here. Okay, we can take one more question if there is any. Yes. The, the, maybe this is related to this massive masses, but there is a general question of, uh, how we start with 10 dimensional theory and how we go to super cosmic models. Mm -hmm. So that involves fixing particular copper gauge and naively you may say torus factorize and massless fermion factorize. That doesn't happen in your construction. And um, well, again, that could be related to some. Yeah, it could very well. This matrix depends on the gauge. As yeah, yeah, know. yeah. So it could be some gauge freedom, which sort of. Uh, yeah, th that's an excellent point, which somehow also goes a little bit back to what some things that Ricardo was saying about you know the, how things depend on how you choose the gauge. But I swept many things under the rug, and one of these is that I fix light con gauge, but I also fix kappa gauge. And the light con kappa gauge that I fix actually puts some of the massless, some of the fermions come from the morally are related to the T4 part. And some of them are related to the ADS3 cross S3 uh, coset or super coset. So it's not that I'm just keeping the, the fermions from the super coset and putting four free bosons as you might do in other approaches. The way that I impose the kappa gauge, which is sort of forced onto me, by my choice of having light con in this way and having certain symmetries realized in a certain way, sort of mixes up 
the part that has to do with the coset and the part that has to do with the T4. So that might be a remnant of that, but in a way that is not transparent once you know, like you you do this bootstrap. No, thank you very much. That's an excellent uh, point. Thanks. Okay, so let's thank Alessandro again.